India wanted to overtake China and the United States, it can do so. If India were to develop its educational system properly, uh, we could overtake China in the next 10, 15 years. What? That's a pretty bold statement to make. Let's talk about coronavirus. India needs 1.2 million doses of vaccine shots. There's only one place you can go to to get 1.2 billion, and you know who that is. Doesn't that kind of validate the power of China has over the world, or you disagree with that? I disagree because we are the largest producer of vaccines. U.S., China, or we can stand alone? We need a solid alliance with the United States in the present juncture, at least for 10 years. India doesn't have the weapon system we need to deal with China. In a way, they're eliminating enemies, and it sounds like you're the last one they haven't eliminated. What's U.S.'s biggest threat long term? The United States doesn't have the staying power once they make a decision. Now you're going to leave Afghanistan. You went there and suddenly you just say, no, Taliban can take home. I don't think that we have to worry about China. In fact, China has to worry about us. My guest today is Dr. Sabramanian Swami from India, who is an author, politician, economist, statistician, and the former union cabinet to Raja Sabah. Uh, under the uh, member of parliament. And he's done a lot of different work with their government. There are a lot of different work in the government there. And you may not know him or his face in the US or other places, but in India, everybody knows who this man is. Former professor also at IIT, which I had a chance to speak over there a couple of years ago in specifically in the topic of mathematical e uh, economics. And he's got an, uh, a PhD in economics from Harvard. With that being said, sir, thank you so much for being a guest on Valuetainment. Thank you. So I got to tell you, I sit down, I watch one of your videos, and I go to the second one, third one, fourth one, fifth one. I'm addicted. Like my, my algorithms right now think <laughs> I'm your number one fan because I've been watching your stuff. But uh, if, if you don't mind taking a quick minute and giving an intro to the audience for them to know what your background is before we get into the topics, I think that'd be great for the audience. Well, I started as an academic, and I came back. To India, which very few people do, because I was also in the faculty at Harvard. And to leave all that and uh, being a student of uh, two famous or most famous economists, uh, Samuelson and Kuznets, I left it all, came back. I said, I want to work in India. But uh, I had, uh, unfortunately, the ideology that uh, India can only progress through a market economy. And we were those days. Uh, uh, very pro-Soviet uh, socialism. And, uh, and so the intellectuals all ganged up to see that I didn't teach at uh, any university for a long time. So by the time I did three years at uh, IIT Delhi as a full professor, uh, they sacked me. And of course, uh, I fought it in the court. And after 21 years, I won the uh, case. But uh, by then, I'd become a cabinet minister. And so I, I said, no, I'm not going back to the place which didn't want me. And I made them pay all my back salary at 8% uh, interest, which was um, much more than I would have got if I was getting my graduate and pension. So uh, I entered politics at a, in the parliament at a very young age. I've been six times to parliament uh, in each, uh, uh, and uh, each time I chose uh, not my native town, uh, but I uh, chose uh, Bombay. I got elected twice from Bombay. I went twice from the central state of UP. And then uh, once uh, from the, my hometown, Madurai, in Tamil Nadu. And now I am actually a nominee of the president, which is a prestigious appointment for my eminence in economics uh, in, in the upper house of parliament. So it, that's how I am. I am, of course, uh, uh, very strong in uh, the, economics, which is market oriented. Um, and uh, of course, I've, I've got a tremendous reputation in the country, I think, uh, for having opposed dictatorship of Mrs. Gandhi and succeeding. And uh, so, um, um, and uh, I've done now 50 years of uh, politics in India. So, so if for the, for the American folks, if you were to say, you would be dot, dot, dot of US, who would be the comparable to who you are in the US? I know it's kind of a tough one to do because everybody has their own individual identity, but who would be a comparable to someone like you in the US? Well, in terms of uh, putting across ideas and then, uh, you know, uh, which are unpalatable, but 
in an agreeable way, I would say I would compare myself most with John Ronald Reagan. Got it. Uh, I, I figured that when I was reading some of the views, I figured that I would put you as a Milton Friedman, Ronald Reagan type of a person, maybe those two, uh, uh, some of the views that you have. So can you walk us through, I mean, if you look at the numbers today, India went from not being in the top 10 of GDP, they were not a name that was being talked about, then they went into top 10, then you moved into number five, then you dropped to number seven, then I think right now you're number six GDP, but India's come up, walk us through the history of what's happened to India, specifically, say the last 60 years, what changes has India gone through the last 60 years? Uh, well, <clears throat> first of all, uh, the GDP calculation you are relying is on basis of the exchange rates which prevail in the market. Uh, but we economists don't use that. We use what is called as the purchasing power parity rate, which means uh, if I'm going to evaluate uh, tomatoes in my or pizzas in my uh, GDP, uh, either I will use the American price or the Indian price because the quality is the same. So the uh, valuation goes up and we are actually in absolute GDP, now the third largest in the world. I saw that. And not uh, fifth or sixth, which is subject to the exchange rate. The exchange rate, uh, the values of uh, GDP also goes down. So uh, I think India has come a long way because we were really exploited and completely drained of resources during the British period. Before that, we had the Islamic invasions, which uh, destroyed uh, our country in many ways. And then uh, after the independence, uh, we began really the bottom of the heap. And, uh, and over the years, uh, we, have, we would have done, gone much faster, much further, had we not adopted the Soviet socialism for the first 40 years. And uh, now, uh, uh, in the last six years, unfortunately, our prime minister is uh, innocent of economics. So he has been doing a lot of ad hoc things which have failed. And uh, if you look at our GDP graph, it's been, this growth rate has been declining consistently from 2016. And now it's in minus because of the corona, but we were down to just 3% uh, in the last quarter before the uh, uh, corona uh, pandemic, uh, virus pandemic came. So uh, we need, uh, we can turn around and we can grow very fast uh, because the amount of potential we have is enormous. I could evaluate, I, I deliberate on that during the course of the interview. But I would say that if India wanted to overtake China, it can do so. And if India wanted to challenge the United States, which is um, the United States, the main strength is your ability to innovate and bring in new innovations. Uh, and raise the productivity of capital and labor. And we have sh shown our Indians in the United States have shown that we got as much brains as the Americans. So therefore, uh, if India were to develop its educational system properly, uh, I think uh, we could be a challenge to the United States and uh, overtake uh, China uh, uh, in the next 10, 15 years. That's a pretty bold statement to make, to, to say overtake China in the next 10 or 15 years, which which we'll get into that here in a minute. But prior to getting into that, you know, in the US, Gandhi is seen as a hero. Who is Gandhi to you? Mahatma Gandhi is, uh, uh, was a man who actually converted the uh, fight for freedom from just petitioners that we had before, highly educated people who went to Cambridge and Oxford and, uh, you know, qualified at the bar of law. And, uh, but, he may convert, he himself was of course trained in the, I mean, educated in England. Uh, he became a barrister. He went and practiced in South Africa for some time, but uh, he has completely transformed himself. He started wearing Indian clothes and that too of the poor farmer. Uh, and then he converted this fight for independence into a mass movement. And um, he had uh, ideas which, you know, we found it very difficult in a modern world to uh, practice. But his, uh, his direction was super. He wanted India to stand on its own feet. And uh, he thought that we had the resources to do that, which he was right. But I think subsequently uh, his successor or his nominated successor in, in, in the government, Mr. Nehru, didn't follow anything of his uh, ideology. And uh, so he just remains as a kind of an emotional figure, as one who got his freedom but not that his ideology has been given a go by. 
Fair enough. So, so let's go back to what, what you were talking. The only reason I bring that up because 60 years, you know, uh, uh, us Americans, we go to school, you read the books, you like quotes all over Instagram. You're thinking, wow, it's 100% all good, but maybe there's a different perspective. I've had a chance to visit Mumbai and I had a chance to go to one of his homes that I believe is now a museum and get a chance to walk through and see what the place looked like. It was very interesting to learn. Uh, there's a picture, I believe, of Obama there visiting his place of living. They have a picture in the museum of Obama being there. But you speak very bluntly of PM Modi. You've, you've called him out. You've said he's a great politician, but a naive economist. There's other words yes. you use, but you haven't necessarily complimented him on the economy <laughs> side. But, but it sounds like you guys have known each other from the 70s. There's a relationship yes. there between the two of you. And yes. You will also recommended that you think you should be his, uh, uh, his finance minister. If yeah. you were his finance minister today, with what they have going on in the economy, with your level of confidence to say where India can overtake China in the next 10 or 15 years, you mentioned education, but I kind of want you to go a little bit deeper. What are some yeah. recommendations you would make for India to make adjustments in order to compete with China and potentially U.S.? In the first place, you see, uh, it's well known to economists. I, I never said he is, uh, and the phrase used, used about his economic knowledge of economics. I, thought, I said he doesn't know any economics, which is much harsher. It's much harsher than <laughs> I, fact. yes, I was trying to be a little <laughs> bit more subtle. So, uh, you see, the uh, question today, after this corona of one and a half years or whatever, uh, is that we, have a, essentially what's the, our finance ministry, which is also uh, a lot of low IQ people in, uh, have been packed into it because they are obedient. This is one of the weakness of Modi. He is a friend of mine. I've known him for a long time, but he, he just likes people to work for him and not uh, you know, become an independent pole. So I'm being kept out uh, on that ground. I don't mind because I'm doing so many other things. But the fact is, that uh, uh, today uh, we have what we call as a gross demand shortage. And that demand shortage has come because the working class, the middle income, middle income groups, they've all lost incomes. And, <clears throat> uh, and the, the migrant workers are all out of employment. And uh, if you, you can see some of the manifestation, if you go to an automobile uh, uh, showroom, you'll find cars and cars lined up. You'll be surprised, why? Because there's no demand. So the economic growth has to be first positioned. How are you gonna augment this demand? And there are two ways of doing it. One is put like uh, your Americans did, uh, starting with the, uh, with the, uh, starting with the, um, with uh, but Trump and then now with uh, Biden, you're putting money into the hands of the people. People are getting checks in their own bank accounts in the United States. I mean, those who go, you know, go, couldn't go to work. And that uh, you know, kept your demand up. And so it's not such a bad situation in the United States. But here, there was across the board, except of course the very rich, uh, where there was a, uh, a you know, the sharp fall in demand. So our policy should have been to see how we can uh, put money into the hands of the people. What other things we can do to, to increase demand? One of the things I've suggested is that uh, the income tax in our country is not paid in agriculture because all agriculture incomes are exempt from income tax. In the uh, uh, urban areas, there is a cutoff point and above that only you pay income tax and that the total amount is um, not more than two to three percent of our uh, of our revenue so i'm saying that and then these laws are so complicated uh, that people have to hire chartered accountants and so on to you know just uh, uh, to convince the income tax inspector that you are not, not uh, you're not fudging your accounts and their cases and our cases have been there. People are harassed and they spend an enormous amount of time preparing income tax returns. So I've said when you're getting such a small amount from income tax, abolish it. And it doesn't matter, the rich will be benefited by that. 
But uh, the middle class also, which does bulk of the savings, you know, in our country, unlike the United States, the United States, <clears throat> if you would be surprised to know that the uh, household saving is negative because most people are borrowing and they don't save. Uh, in India, 80% of our total savings is comes from the households because people are very, uh, you know, they want to provide for the future. And so we, our people save a lot. Now you should encourage them. Then you find that the interest rates in the United States, you can get a loan for 2%, but in India, yeah, it's not less than 12%. And then with the amount of corruption and then the banks and so on, you end up paying 15%. Interesting. And uh, the, if you put money in, the, in, a, in a term deposit, you get only 6% rent. And, you know, I mean, uh, interest. Uh, interest rate, interest payments. So you should raise that to 9%. And so that people you know, find that saving is worthwhile and not just you know, buying gold and keeping it in, in stock. So I would say that I would begin by freeing the demand forces by either way. There's another third one. You build a road and print notes and give them uh, wages. Uh, that, that becomes demand too. And um, uh, you know the, we are still living in the past about the gold standard and all that. The, the money you print is owed to yourself. Hey, there's a debt, okay, it's a big debt, but you owe it to yourself. Nobody's going to come and liquidate you. So there's no harm when there's a demand shortage to print notes liberally so that you can pay people for public works and so on. So therefore, I would uh, begin by focusing on generating employment and putting money people into the hands of people so it becomes demand, lower the interest rates uh, because the interest rates are too high and uh, they have, uh, have a negative uh, thing, especially in the small and medium industry, which is about 60% of our industry. Uh, they are finding very hard to get capital and they are all closing down and that creates unemployment. So you said, so so interest rates in US, if I wanna go borrow something, rates right now are 2%, let's just say give or take, it's nothing. The money is free right now if you wanna get it so cheap. But in yeah. India, you said 12 to 15% because the bank is also gauging, at, you know, gouging, adding additional two or 3%. But you said savings is 6%. So a saving account in India right now pays six percent to yes it's a term deposit that means you have to put it in for five years five years okay so it's even a five year six percent that's a lot higher than us us doesn't have a fixed annuity or even a bond you get nowadays for five years you're lucky if you're looking at a percent to two percent so six is a bigger number but you're saying lower the interest rates bring it down make money a little bit easier get rid of taxes if if india gets rid of taxes how does the government uh, uh, generate revenue or in order to be able to sustain military, all the other things? How does India do that? Well, there are two ways. One is, of course, the indirect, indirect taxes, sales tax, excise tax, you know, tax on when you purchase, the, these will continue. And uh, they're, in fact, the bulk of the taxes we are getting today. I mean, income tax gets you hardly anything except harassment. Second is, uh, that uh, uh, we, uh, in, in our country, we, uh, we, we need, if you, if you lower the interest rate in borrowing, uh, people will get the money. They, they will, they'll be happy to pay that kind of lower interest rates. I'm not talking about the interest rates uh, that you get on a fixed deposit that I would call as the rate of return. Uh, but in terms of interest rate on loans, that if you lower it, you will find people will borrow money. And, uh, uh, and, and that's how you put money into the people's hands. What, what gives you confidence to believe that India can compete with China and US in the next 10 or 15 years? See, uh, US, I'll answer a second. First, let me answer China. How, uh, what was the growth rate between India and China between 1950 and 1980? About the same, three and a half percent per year, which is dismally low. And then uh, what the Chinese did, especially because of Teng Xiaoping, he, made, he improved his relations with the United States and told the United States, you're buying so many consumer durables from Japan and South Korea and so on. And uh, in these countries now they're getting prosperous and the wage rates are going up and so the uh, earlier on, you, 
you know, Motorola was more expensive than say a Toyota, or, I mean, not uh, uh, one of these uh, Panasonic, etc. cetera. And uh, now they, they, you know, the, the Motorola is out of the business completely. And uh, these people's uh, prices are going up. And what I, I, they proposed was that let these nations, which are you know influenced, can be influenced by you, uh, give us semi-processed goods, and we will add value to it and then export it to the United States at the same cheap price that you were getting before. So now take Lenovo. Uh, Taiwan gives you the circuits and uh, the the, uh, the base. It comes to China, and there they put in the keyboard and they put the glass and then the case and then put Lenovo made in China. It's not really made in China. So this switch trade, uh, if you look at the Chinese statistics, uh, they are always in a deficit of trade with the East Asian countries, but in a huge surplus of trade, uh, payments of course, uh, payments out of trade uh, with, the, with Europeans and the Americans. So this switch trade is now, they're running out of steam on that because Chinese labor is also becoming very expensive. And uh, their, their non-adherence to uh, inter, inter, intellectual property rights and so on, these East Asian countries are willing to look at an alternative and India can be that alternative. But India needs to remove all the, the, the what, these cobwebs that we have inherited from the British rule, you know, the regulation on this, regulation on that. This simplification of regulation, Mr. Modi didn't do, he made it even more complicated in my opinion. And you simplify that, and make it possible for, uh, for foreign investors uh, from Japan uh, and uh, South Korea and the Philippines and uh, you know, Taiwan to come with the minimum hassles. If you wanna buy land today in India to build a factory, it takes you six years to get the land. Why is that? So, yeah, because uh, yeah, there'll be court case, somebody will file it. <laughs> are you being serious? <laughs> are, are you being serious? Yes, 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 yes. You try and buy land in India. <laughs> I mean, I'm talking about the, to build a factory. You see, so there's a, a lot of problems. Then the, the left wing tra trade unions will also come in. Oh, yeah. Well, most people you talk to any foreign investment, that's the problem they have. That's why they go to cities and do uh, um, ITs, IT matters, because in Bangalore, you can get an apartment and the Indians are cheap labor. And, you know, we, we produce a lot of uh, uh, good uh, IT products, uh, intellect, I mean, uh, the information technology products. So I am, I'm saying that uh, if you do this, simplify, people will come with the money. And uh, yeah, they'll get a very good rate of return. But the hassles are the ones which are stopping them from coming. In many cases, they have to go, many of these developed countries have gone, decided to go to other countries. Take for example, uh, when I was commerce minister, I had gone to this uh, Brussels for the conference on on, uh, on uh, WTO, creation of a WTO. And we got textiles, which the Americans had the most, you know, most, uh, you know, oppressive uh, tariff rates. We got the, uh, I got in, in fact, in a bilateral meeting with the Americans uh, that they would lower these rates for our garments and so on to come. But we didn't get the benefit of it. China and Bangladesh got it. And we are still nowhere in this. So this is because the textile industries don't have the incentive to export. So uh, it, it, I'm saying the potential, same thing with agriculture. We have uh, you know, as much uh, arable land as uh, China, but we produce only one quarter of what China produces on a plot of land. They were in fact produce three, three, uh, three crops a year. We produce in only 25% more than one crop. We can easily, because in India, at least we don't have snow and uh, we have uh, 12 months of the year, you can do agriculture. Uh, we have uh, 150 million cows and we give an average of 200 liters per year. One Israeli cow gives you 11,000 liters per year. So I, I think the India's potential is tremendous and uh, we need to do it. And uh, electricity can even be given cheap if we get, convert the thorium into uranium and nuclear reactors put all over the country, you will produce enough, not only for yourself to give it away free, but you can give it to your neighbors too. So India is a land of potential and it's a question of tapping that, you see. 
So, so if I look at that's that's interesting on what you're saying. I, I did not know about taking six years to take buy land and build a uh, you know plant on right. it. But you know, if you look at population wise, okay, you look at population wise. If we take and combine, uh, uh, I believe it's U.S. plus Canada plus all of Europe plus Australia plus all of New Zealand plus all of South America, we have 1.432 billion people, okay? I'll say that one more time. US, Canada, all of Europe, all of South America, Australia and New Zealand, 1.432 billion people. China alone is 1.439 billion people. India is 1.366, okay? So, so automatically you have a lot more enhanced uh, inventory wise to be able to grow that. Now the fertility rate has slowed down tremendously in China over the years, you know, they went from, 6.11 and 55. I think they're at, I don't know, 1.69 today. Obviously, some of the laws they came out with that you can't have, you know, all these other laws that they had, they changed it. So it's it's grown, uh, slowed down a little bit. And the median age has gone up from being 21, 19 years old. It's like 38 now, which I think is what they wanted. But now it's kind of uh, scaring them a little bit long term about what could happen. But go back to the playbook of what China did from your perspective. You have 1.366, they have 1.439, US is at 330 million. The numbers just came back from the Census Bureau. Yep. What was the playbook China used to compete in a marketplace in your eyes? What is the playbook US used to be the dominant force in a marketplace? What was both of their playbooks? Because it's a different playbook. Yeah, of course. Uh, they, uh, as I told you, they don't produce anything in China. The semi-processed semi goods come from uh, East Asia. They only add value to it and, you know, and export it to the United States. Uh, I, it's industrial development. I, I, don't, I, I don't think any country should be replicated the way. And today, China has a problem. They're calling it rebalancing. They use all these fancy words. But the fact is that today, China is running into a saturation because their labor has become very expensive. And it's going to be very difficult to uh, bring in raw material or semi-processed goods from East Asia and, and convert it into uh, exportable uh, goods for the United States and Europe. So I, 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 am not, uh, I don't want to repeat the Chinese uh, uh, thing except in a marginal sort of way. I mean, we are in the capable of producing in our country. We don't need semi-processed goods from East Asia. But if East Asia wants to export, of course, uh, it will be advantages for us because we can do use our resources for something else. But India is potential is much more than China. China is in fact, it's a, a agricultural uh, yield per acre is near, near saturation point. It's a uh, industrial thing is based on, uh, on uh, tomorrow the American companies pack up and leave and saying, no, we are no more interested in this processing. Uh, China would have a very big problem uh, in their country. What they have done is you, they've, they've mastered the art of selling abroad. They're great salesmen. And uh, they have uh, brought in a lot of resources. They've been able to sell some of their products more easily. Even today, India, uh, we are importing manufactured products from China. And we just import, export iron ore and uh, this kind of thing. You see. So uh, China's uh, uh, cleverness is not... In, in terms of using its own resources. By, in fact, uh, most of China is, I think, uh, uh, barren. If you go to Gansu province or Urumqi uh, or uh, Tibet, uh, you, you can see. Whereas India is, you know, throughout the country, you have um, uh, greenery and um, uh, ability to manufacture. But our yield per acre is one of the lowest in the world. Our experimental plots in the agricultural uh, Indian, Agri uh, Indian Agricultural Research Institute is six times what we get in uh, the farmers get. And we have neglected the farmers because we followed the Soviet pattern. And the Soviet pattern was extract resources from agriculture and finance heavy industrials, industrialization. And in the sense that the British also uh, broke the back of the, of the agricultures, but we also did for the first 40 years. It's only barely now we are in a position where some parts of India are producing bumper crops like Punjab, which is of course now in agitation, South India uh, and the district of Punjabur like that. So where is the problem for India? We don't have the right policies. We don't lack anything else. 
If you want water, desalination of seawater, you've got the longest uh, uh, coastline uh, any big nation is having, you see. Uh, desalination of seawater, the Chinese, uh, the Israelis have done a wonderful job of that. Um, and uh, we have 60% of the thorium in our country. If the uranium gets exhausted, which is expected in another 20 years, it will be India, which will be dominating the nuclear fuel. So, well, what is it that India enacts? And our people have got brains. They've shown it in America. They've shown it in so many European countries. They're not able to show it in India because we have got this bureaucratic structure, uh, which uh, you know uh, suffocates our people and uh, doesn't give them due credit. If somebody does something, then then his boss wants to take the credit. You know, you said uh, uh, if America was to leave China tomorrow, to China would be, in, in layman's terms, screwed. If America was to yes, leave China, so, yeah. <laughs> but but here's a question for you: If you look yes. at if you look at uh, uh, the world's manufacturing superpower, you know China's here, then you got U.S., then you got Japan, Germany, then it's India, right? Meaning they have manufacturing; they're dominating the marketplace. Whether it's chips, pharmacy, you know, people are trying. Eighty percent of all the pharmacy being produced there. Don't you think America kind of empowered China so much that it got the world to rely way too much on China, which is now harder to lean away and get away from yeah. China? Because what you're saying is, it makes sense when you say if America decides to pack their lunch and leave tomorrow and just say, you know, well, we're out of here. That's true. But I don't think America can do that because now they're too reliant on the Chinese economy and that's given China the power. Well, see, first of all, uh, one uh, historical event the Americans couldn't have foreseen, uh, and none of us would have. In fact, I had to pinch myself to believe it has happened. That is the unraveling of the Soviet Union. China was a counter. And it made sense. They, they, they had very bad relations with the Soviet Union. So the United States saw this as a strategic advantage and therefore assisted that the way the Americans assisted the Chinese for their development is unbelievable, but particularly because you gave them so much market access in your own country. And uh, so they benefited by that. And now, uh, now they, are, they, they may talk tough and so on, but if, uh, if some of the democratic countries got together, they will be in real royal soup. China would be. Yeah, China would. Be. Okay, so let, let's talk about coronavirus. You know, the cases you're in India, we hear yeah. about the news. It's uh, the seven day average uh, in February in cases was 11,145 a day. The yeah. seven day average yeah. right now, as of May 9th, is 389,000 cases a day. The seven yeah. day average on death is nearly 4,000, 3941, right? And we're seeing the story. I'm mentoring, uh, helping out with this one. Uh, uh, company in India, I sit on their board and I'm talking to them and I said, what does it look like? He says, you don't even know how bad it is right now. They're in the capital where most of the COVID is taking place. Workers going home, nobody's buying, you know, there's a lot of fear there, right? Okay. So then a number comes out saying, well, Modi wasn't responsible. He said he's going to get more vaccines out. He didn't. Doesn't this validate, because the number that came out is China, uh, India needs 1.2 million doses of vaccine shots, right? 1.2 uh, billion. That's a big number, 1.2 billion. And there's only one place you can go to to get 1.2 billion, and you know who that is. I mean, that's what a lot of people are talking about. It's China. Doesn't that kind of validate the power of power China has over the world, or you disagree with that? I disagree because we are the largest producer of vaccines, not China. So if you're the largest but producer we, of we, we were, became complacent because uh, by, uh, by end of December and uh, January of uh, this year, 2021, uh, it looked as if the corona is gone. And the prime minister went and boasted that I have solved the problem of corona. I've defeated them in the World Economic Survey, uh, World Economic Conference or whatever it's called in Switzerland. And uh, he, of course, it was online, but he, uh, his speech, he said, I have solved this problem. I'm ready to assist any other country which wants to solve the problem. And out of the blue, this uh, second uh, wave came. And we, we had forgotten. You see, the, uh, the, the, there is a lot of, it's a, we are a democracy, so we've got a lot of lobbies. And uh, the British uh, uh, Oxford, uh, AstraZeneca, uh, or whatever it's called, 
they wanted it to be manufactured in India. There was an Indian company which was doing for by, by a different route. Uh, they were producing these vaccines which are far safer, tested and effective too. And I took that uh, there. Uh, but originally when the prime minister announced that the contract is going, it, he only announced this uh, AstraZeneca uh, um, uh, vaccine produced in, in Pune. And now the owner has gone off to London and he's sitting there because there have been so many, I mean, there must have been 200 deaths uh, in that, whereas in this other one, co-vaccine, co uh, produced entirely domestically, uh, there has been hardly any. So uh, we, uh, we became complacent and we are paying the price for that complacency. And uh, this attempt to want to grab credit and then to, uh, project yourself in the world this weakness of politicians, you know, they, this is partly responsible because nobody wanted to as I, utter a word of caution. I, of course, I was in. I'm the parliamentary committee on health, so I was the one who fought and got the uh, the, the, the co vaccine uh, to be cleared on the same day. And now the government is putting all its faith in the co vaccine because the other one is, uh, you know, we don't know where it is. Uh, when the owner himself has gone away to Britain, uh, we don't know what's going to happen. So we, yes, we are behind, we are responsible for what happened. In a matter like uh, oxygen, I am I'm surprised a country like uh, India not being able to supply oxygen because we didn't make, uh, make arrangements because oxygen requires a lot of you know, trucking and the transportation and cylinders and so on. And none of that was being thought of, just uh, having enough oxygen is not enough. So, so in in what so you're saying as far as the vaccine goes, India doesn't at all rely on China for any of the vaccine because you can produce your largest manufacturer. What what does India rely on China with? Because if there's one thing India did in the last twelve months, you guys banned TikTok, all these apps. I think on one week it was a hundred apps that were fully banned of China and India, which I applaud uh, for them to take that position because nobody else is willing to take that position. A lot of people are scared. Trump almost did something where he forced them to want to sell TikTok, but you know, it was kind of confusing how that ended up taking place. <laughs> what, what does India rely on China with? And if it's nothing, what, how, does, how does India view China? Does India view China as an ally or does it view as they you know, number one enemy it faces? Well, first of all, let me start with your last point. Chinese have crossed a mutually agreed line of actual control. We drew a line in 1993 saying that there are disputes on uh, whose land is whose land. And we will, uh, you know, take the present situation, the status quo, and we'll draw a line where there's no disputes. And uh, in that, the Chinese got a big chunk of uh, Kashmir, the part of Kashmir, which is now called a, a separate con a state called Ladakh. But over the period of the previous government, they had been silently coming into our land. And this continued even after we came to power. Now, I, I do not know whether the prime minister knew about it. I, I can't believe that he wouldn't have known. He had 18 meetings, one-to-one -one with Xi Jinping. One-to-one, -one. One, either in India or in, in China, turn by turn. And suddenly out of the blue, we come to learn that they have come and occupied our land. And uh, it's about 2,000 square kilometers. And now they are, you know, they're in force, they, they are uh, increasing their forces. I think they are, they are, they, are, they are thinking, I don't know whether they've got a date, but they're certainly going to have another attack. And the attack was actually by the Chinese aimed at eliminating India from the global map. That we are number two. I mean, we are in the second category of nations, not in the first category. The first category is only United States and, and China. And India is waffling because we are not able to we have been uh, you know, brainwashed earlier that we should be non-aligned, uh, non-aligned with what, uh, with whom. And we should have a clear policy that today, the weapon systems are the best in the United States. We don't want US troops in India because our troops are sufficient to deal with China. 
but we certainly need uh, uh, the weapon systems that the US is willing to give. Certainly, I would like to see um, uh, like to see your F-35 uh, being given to us. You gave it to Turkey, I think. Uh, but I don't know what, what is the, uh, the magnet. The Indians have decided to sign a contract and pay uh, 100,000 uh, crores uh, to uh, the Russians for S-400. Now, S-400's electronics are entirely Chinese. Second, I don't know whether the world realizes the Russians, in effect, are a junior partner of China. They can't go against China. They are bankrupt and the Chinese have been financing them. And so, therefore, they, they, today we need clarity. We can defeat the Chinese. We have the weapons. We have the, 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 the wherewithal to engage in a, a, a warfare because the logistics is in favor of India. The Chinese have to come from a long distance and through Tibet and then cross a mountain, then come down. So we can defeat them. And in fact, in hand to hand combat, we have already defeated them. But uh, the fact is now it's going to be the weapon system. And uh, we need to therefore have a clear understanding with the United States. The main problem with the Indian politicians is we are too emotional. If you praise them, they think, oh, we are, we are now arrived, we are the greatest in the world. Whereas the Americans are all practical people. I've lived with them, I know everything is give and take. What's in it for me, or what I'll give you, and what I want from you. Now, that kind of language you should speak to the Americans. And Americans, I know, want to give up some. They, they, want, they want to give up some of their. Uh, they want to give up some of their um, uh, responsibilities in, say, the Indo-Pacific. I think we are in a position to take it tomorrow. If India and Indonesia came together, the Chinese won't be able to go through the Malacca Strait. They can't come from their uh, eastern coast and go to the, uh, to, to the west because we can stop them there. So we have uh, that kind of thing. But the Chinese are very hardworking people. They have got the Sri Lankans on their side. They have got the Bangladeshis on their side. All our neighboring countries are today, if they are not pro-Chinese, they certainly don't want to annoy them. And we are in a terrible situation. So do, do you think China uh, uh, sees you? So in a way, uh, they're eliminating enemies one by one by one. And it sounds like you're the last one they haven't eliminated before they go after the big guys. And you know what the big guys. So I think you are in the way of US because yes. right now India is, they have three choices, okay? They have three choices. Either number one, India is gonna side with US Either India is going to side with China or either India is going to say, we're not siding with anybody. We can stand on our own two feet, right? It, it, it sounds like it's one of those three options. Long term, what do you think is going to be happening? Because when, when the coronavirus started spreading in, in, in India, you saw Chinese diplomat, diplomats all the way at the top tweeting. Their tweet is Weibo. I don't know if you saw what they said about India. It says, look what's going on in India and look what we're doing. We're shooting rockets up, up in the space and we're going to Mars. We're doing all this. Other yeah, stuff. and we are burning bodies. Yes, they're burning <laughs> bodies. So, so do, do you, what do you think long term is going to be India's position? Not just the right thing to take, but what do you foresee taking place with India? US, China, or we can stand alone? If, if India can get, uh, get, get stacked together on the economic policy, uh, we will uh, be able to stand on our own in 10 years. But India doesn't have the weapon system we need to deal with China. And uh, Americans obviously can't uh, send their troops here to fight the Chinese. So we need an, a solid alliance with the United States in the present juncture, at least for 10 years. And we have got into something called the Quad, but our Government is uh, dilly dallying on how you know how much to commit, how much not to commit, and uh, China is not an option as long as the present leadership is there. There could be a change. Mao Zedong changed, and Deng Xiaoping came. Everything changed, and so if Xi Jinping goes and somebody else comes, who is not like Xi Jinping, then I think we can we uh, we have a historically a very long relationship with China. And at man to man, there is a lot of, you know, love and respect for the for each other. 
we admire the Chinese for all the things they are. They admire our culture. In fact, in 1936, uh, I put this in my book, uh, the president of Beijing University, who later was an ambassador for the Republic of China, the Chiang Kai-shek by China, he came to Harvard invited to speak at the tricentennial function. And they asked him to speak on any topic that is of great importance to China. And what was the topic? The Indianization of China, a case of peaceful borrowing for 300 years. And I've given all the references. You can uh, access it through the Widener Library of Harvard. So this speech, he says that the Indians were mesmerized us with their concepts of God and you know, um, uh, the uh, various uh, uh, um, uh, incidents that took place and how the gods intervened, how they helped the human being. He says they were snowed in by that and he was not happy about it. He said, we have to get, exercise it out. And of course the communists came and it all went. <clears throat> but even today, when, when uh, there is no hostility, I've been to China many times. I, I really like China. I know their culture. I like their food even especially. But they, they have treated me with great respect. But today we have a political problem. After all, I am an Indian nationalist to begin with. And friendship can't be something that we can uh, say, no, 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 uh, we should continue to be friends with China, even if they grab our territory. Uh, that we can't do. So we are going to have problems for 10 years. We need the Americans, uh, particularly in the weapons system. If we change our economic policy and bring in what is, uh, what, uh, you know, which means what? You, then be clear about your objectives. You clear, be clear about your priorities. You be clear about your strategy. And you be clear about how you're going to mobilize your resources. And you can grow at 10% per year uh, for 10 years and you will be already uh, abreast of China. And then on you can overtake and then it becomes uh, you and the Americans. So, and that, that will be a friendly match. It won't be a hostile match because you are a democracy and we have got so many Indians in the United States. I can't see a situation where India and the uh, United States will be ever in a hostile position we can have. Uh, you know, we can have exchange abuses and things like that. But the fact is that uh, we need to have clarity. We have a problem with the Chinese sitting on our territory and we can't go with the Russians because they are no more the Soviet Union. They are now a junior partner of China. And therefore, uh, uh, the squad is, squad, of course, those other, uh, Australia and uh, Japan, they are, well, they are really allies of the Americans. So it's really India and the United States. So India with this huge population, huge military, uh, it's not the capacity to, uh, to take on China, especially in that terrain. And uh, we, don't, we have no interest in crossing the mountains and capturing Chinese property, and Chinese territory. And uh, that is the way forward. But I don't know whether our prime minister has got this kind of a mindset uh, because he has even today not said that the Chinese have aggressed and come and occupied our territory. Not even once. You're, you're a Reagan uh, fan. So you know how Reagan said, we're one generation away from losing our freedom. Do you think India is one generation away from being owned by China? Uh, of, of losing what? One generation away of being owned by China. Because you said 18 meetings with G. one-on-one, -on -one, Modi had, some in India, some in China, but it's one-on-one face-to-face. -on -one -face and they're still buying land and gradually, you know, moving into India. Do you think because China typically is a long-term thinker, they're patient for Modi to not uh, win an election. So the next guy comes and they can hopefully win that uh, person over to allow them to start <laughs> investing into China. You know what I'm asking, right? I mean, I, I think I you know what that. I'm asking. I know that. I don't think that uh, the case of Modi is out of love for China that he is doing that, there's some other factors uh, since I don't know. Um, I, I, I mean, I'm not being properly briefed on it, so I can't say. But he has been consistently avoiding taking a confrontationist position with China. He's been consistently denying. In fact, they use the media, our government used the media to make out that the Chinese are actually withdrawn and gone back till the satellite photos came and made a joke of it. 
So uh, uh, I, I would say that the Indian psychology is such that we have a long history, by the way, these Islamic forces ruled us for 600 years and the British ruled us for 200 years, all brutally, but we survived them. As uh, Iran was a uh, Zoroastrian country, uh, the Islamic forces took, over, took them over in 15 years, they made them 100% Islamic. Same thing with Babylon and, uh, and, uh, and uh, other parts in, uh, you know, which are now called Iraq, Egypt, even the Christians took uh, 50 years uh, for Europe, but in our case, 600 years and 200 years, and you're still 82% what you were, uh, that is the Hindu population. So we, are, we, we, uh, we may look passive, but we are not passive. Well, we, we have fought and uh, overcome many, many, many uh, um, you know, back reverses, and we have come out on top. We had a case in 1965 when the Americans used to make fun of us that we are living from ship to mouth because we had there was a failure of the agricultural crop, and so the Americans had to send under a scheme called the PL 480 grain. They used to send grain by by ship to India, and they said that India is living from ship to mouth. If one ship doesn't come, there'll be starvation. And there were predictions that in 10 years, India will have food riots and people will eat each other up, written by a State Department uh, official called uh, uh, World Famine. It's called World Famine. You can access it through Google. So uh, uh, that India has then, go, in a short period of 10 years, got agriculture, uh, what they call is green revolution. And today we are exporters of grain at the cheapest price in the world. If we get market access, we'll be selling a, a, a wheat to America, which of course the Americans won't allow. But if we could, we, we would be able to sell you the, all the wheat you want. So I, I think the potential of India is, can be any time invoked if you have the, uh, the, the perspective, you have the, the thinking and the self-confidence that we can do it ourselves and we can. We, we, I don't think uh, that we have to worry about China. In fact, China has to worry about us. You really believe that? Absolutely, because if history goes, we, we are the ones who uh, went to China, our, all our religious leaders went, and you please read uh, uh, what uh, Hu Shi says, Dr. Hu Shi. He has said precisely this. They just came here and they gave us wonderful concepts and we just fell for it. Never again we should. In fact, Hu Shi went to the other extreme and wanted the China to become Christian so that we never have another... <laughs> Hindu invasion. It's it's it seems like it's the game of who who can get the most people to think like them, right? Americans think in a certain way, Indians think in a certain way, the Chinese think in a certain way. Then you have religions, you know, Christians think in a certain way, you know, uh, uh, Sikhs think in a certain way, Buddhists think in a certain way, Muslims think in a certain way. It's the imposing of the way of thinking to see who can win at the end. So is it more philo philosophies or is it more religious beliefs to be imposed? This is a completely different conversation because I think India is number two country in the world population wise for Muslims. It's shy of 200 million. I want to say 195, 196 million, give or take. And I think number one is Indonesia is at like 216, 220 million people that they have there yeah. in regards to the Muslim population. What, what yeah. concerns you more, the, the certain religious ideologies being imposed on the uh, Indian population, or does the you know, more philosophy of Chinese trying to get uh, folks in India to think like them? What concerns you more long term? You know, in, uh, over the last, uh, maybe I should say, thousand years, uh, the Hindu religion has got compartmentalized into concepts which are not there in our uh, scriptures. For instance, this Brahmin, uh, you know, the, the warrior class called the Kshatriya, the um, commercial class called the Vaishya, and the farmers called Shudra, and this untouchables that uh, uh, has grown. Uh, this is not there in our scriptures, and it's not birth-based. We today make it birth-based. 
I am called a Brahmin because my parents were Brahmins. Okay, but Brahmin is a is a characteristic. If you are given up all the material uh, aspirations uh, except the minimal that you need, but concentrate on knowledge, that is called a Brahmin. If you pick up the sword and defend the country, you are then called a Kshatriya. Your father may be a Brahmin, but you will not be a Brahmin. So that has got, uh, you know, it has degenerated into a birth concept and the country has got divided. So this Hindu movement, which about everybody is getting a little panicky about, is not directed at the Muslims. It's directed at ourselves, unite. Yeah, they are, they are crazy people in our country. They are crazy people in the United States. They say all kinds of things about the blacks. I don't think that that's the uh, mainstream American thinking. So uh, in India, we are, those of us, and particularly in the BJP, we are thinking in terms of bringing about a renaissance where we become uh, uh, a one community without uh, threatening anybody else uh, of our, because of our unity. And the only religion in the world I know, and by the way, in our constitution, we include uh, amongst Hindus, we include Buddhists, uh, Sikhs, and, uh, uh, and uh, Jains. And none of the three object to it. So this Sikh separatism is only uh, uh, some guys in uh, San Jose, California. Uh, but in India, the Sikhs are 20% of our army. And uh, the Hindus, so-called Hindus, as differentiated from Sikhs, if the Sikh gurus had not lifted the sword, we would have all been finished. So we owe, uh, I mean, we have that kind of uh, reverence for the Sikh, uh, uh, you know, of the, the people who led the Sikh, Sikh, uh, Sikh movement to its thing. Sikh is a, you know, it doesn't believe in any divisions at all. It's a very, very, uh, if I may use um, uh, or misuse the word Catholic, it's a, they are very Catholic in outlook. Now, the war that was predicted by Professor Huntington of Harvard, called the uh, Clash of Civilizations, was that Christians and Hindus will combine against Muslims. Because Muslims is an international uh, religion. And, uh, but that problem is not there because the Indian Muslims, I would say 95%. They look like us, they are us, because they are all converted people. They haven't come from, some, from, uh, from Mars or something. And their, their social habits are very similar to ours. My own daughter is married to a Muslim. But I can't tell him, I can tell the difference. It's only when the, these mullahs and so on, uh, financed by money from abroad, who want to create this uh, uh, separateness. Yes, there are, there's a lot of prejudice, there's no question about it. It has to be dealt with very strongly. But uh, the, the, the blackening of this Hindu movement in the United States is, is not based on, on, on uh, solid facts. We are not aiming at anybody else. We are saying we are uh, crusted. We have, uh, for years, we have, we have become uh, ossified. So we want now to go back to our scriptures in which all religions lead to God. We have committed to that in our constitution. So they, when you say Hindu, you are, you are automatically assuming that that Hindu will say all religions lead to God. My way, your way, and so on. That's what happened when, uh, when a Jewish delegation came, the chief rabbi came here and I was there in the, to, in the Indian delegation uh, when the, uh, our uh, our uh, uh, religious leaders uh, decided to meet them, meet the uh, religious leaders of, of uh, uh, Juda, Judaism. And uh, they had a problem with us saying that you are a multi uh, polytheistic. We are, you know, we have only one God. I said, we also have one God, but our manifestations are different. They take different forms, but the God is only one. So, I mean, these are the things that need to be told to our younger generation. Only reason, I'm bringing and, this up, the only reason I'm bringing this up is because you did an interview with Showtime and you were talking about, uh, 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 you said, uh, uh, wherever the Muslim population is large, there is trouble. And you gave a percentage yeah. of 30%. Uh, if a yeah. country's Muslim population becomes over 30%, that country is in danger. Why do you, why yeah. do you believe that? Because 
like you said, you said something very interesting. You said 95% of the Muslims in India are converts. It's not like somebody else came in. They converted. So yes. they're like you. They're the only yeah. difference. They believe in Muslims. So, yeah. but yeah. they live together. They go to school together. So what, what concerns you the most? No, I am. Uh, I know that the Muslim population will never be thirty percent in India. The maximum would be fifteen because they are also subject to the same. Uh, the, the population growth rate has been going down. Uh, it's now one point eight percent, and both uh, Hindus have gone down faster because we are economically better off than the Muslims today. And the Muslim population is also going down. Their their growth rates are going down, not as sharply as the Hindus. But uh, it has gone down. And uh, in terms of uh, uh, educated Muslims who uh, uh, we find uh, it's very easy to work with them. We have got them in various places. We have got even in the BJP, which is supposed to be anti-Muslim, we have got ministers who are Muslims. Uh, and uh, so uh, it gets, you know, the black and white presentation of these things is what the difficulties. I certainly believe that in in the countries that are having trouble, take for example, uh, the Palestinian uh, uh, Israel uh, conflict that's going on. Uh, what is the problem? Uh, the Palestinians already have one, line, uh, one country which is called uh, Jordan, which have 50, 50, 55%, uh, 55% are uh, Palestinians. So uh, they got it, they, they, they got a, 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 a authority, Palestinian authority, and if they were agreeing to uh, exist to the, the uh, agreeing to Israel being accepted as a, uh, as a given fact, they, tomorrow they will be recognized as a country. And uh, now you see the UAE, uh, Bahrain, so many countries have now started having diplomatic relations with the, uh, Israel. Look at Egypt, not a single conflict after the, the uh, yeah, yeah, Israelis gave up Sinai. So I, I am not saying that. I'm just saying that in countries where you have this problem, because the idea, theology of Islam says that there are three parts to the world. One is called Darul Islam, where the Muslims are in overwhelming majority and rule. That's called Darul Islam. Then there is a uh, Darul Harab. This is all in Quran. Huh? And, uh, and in the hadiths and the sirah, it's all there and in writing. If, it is, if there is uh, the Muslim population is a minority and the majority is all amorphous, you know, fighting amongst each other, then he says the, ob the object of Muslims, this is what is the, the direction given, the object of Muslims is to slowly go into a majority. And that's called Darul Harab. And then there is the third uh, thing called Darul Ahad, like New Zealand or uh, Australia, where you're, uh, you're, um, uh, you're, a uh, you're a minority, but the majority is uh, united. And there they say, comply. So they will not agree to uniform civil code. That is one man, one woman, which Hindus have, they will say, no, 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 you can't allow, you know, we will have four, four wives, you can't stop us. We have our own separate uh, thing. But in Australia, they have agreed. In the United States, they have agreed. Why can't they agree in India? So there are, uh, you know, these clerics, they read uh, from the Quran. The Quran was written a long, long time ago. There has been no, it's not, you're, you're not allowed to amend it. So these are preached. So therefore, I think the, when I said 30%, uh, I, I had no idea that this is, would be applied to India. It's not in India. India it can, cannot be. They have been uh, from the day of partition uh, after the, uh, Pakistan was created, they have been 12%. Today, they may be 14% or 15% because the census was the last census said they were 14. So I don't know whether they are 15 or 16. There's no doubt that because of poverty, because if you look at the Muslims of Kerala, they have fewer children than the Muslims of UP. Why? Because the UP Muslim is poor compared to the Kerala Muslim. Same thing, the, um, the number of children that Hindus in Kerala have is much less than the number of children that UP, uh, Hindus in UP have because Hindu, uh, UP is a poorer place. 
and the Hindus are also poor on per capita basis. And so they, as the economic growth thing goes, continues, you will find that all these countries do want their ch fewer children so they can educate them and bring them up and to have a better standard of life than they have. And in India, we have no problem. We have got Muslims in the army. We got Muslims in the, our, uh, our number two man on our intelligence is uh, Muslim. Uh, you have Muslims ministers. And this is just, you know, the, the, the uh, people who, a handful uh, of leftists and others who make a demonstration, get international press, and then we are given lectures uh, from, uh, uh, from, uh, from the United States by the liberals there. Last question for you before we wrap up is you, you, you're seem very insightful. What is the biggest threat US faces from your perspective as an outsider, not India, not Russia, not China? What's US's biggest threat long-term? US is uh, biggest threat according to me is not your, any of your internal problems because I have seen having lived in the United States almost continuously for a period of seven years and then in and out, in and out, I've been coming to teach at back at Harvard. Uh, United States is a problem solving country. And uh, when I was there, they were uh, in the 60s, oh my God, the Vietnam War, uh, then the, uh, the, uh, the, those days they used to call themselves Negroes, now they call them uh, black Africans or something. Uh, and uh, they were on streets and were beaten up, they couldn't climb on the bus and uh, you know, so on. And now when I look back on America and when I go to America, I am amazed the amount of progress you make. So you have a problem solving problem. I, I don't expect any difficulty in your social problem. Even Trump may come and Trump may go, but it's not going to change your uh, demography or your political democracy. The thing that I am finding which is disturbing is that United States, doesn't have the staying power once they make a decision. You pulled out of Vietnam, dumped everybody, and then luckily for you, the Vietnamese are anti-Chinese, so they, you know, now they are your friends. Now you're going to leave Afghanistan. Now Afghanistan, you, you went there. You didn't say that I'm going there just to take a revenge. You said, no, no, we are going to transfer it into democracy and so on. And a lot of people trusting you came and joined with you. They took uh, English education. The women uh, dropped their all their uh, pard pardas and uh, I was, we call it in our country is all these uh, garments uh, and became uh, modern women, spoke English. And suddenly you just say, no, Taliban can take over. I mean, this is not the way to generate confidence that you can rely on the United States on a long-term basis. Everything is cost and benefit. Very interesting. Sir, thank you so much for your time. I have really enjoyed it, and I hope the audience has enjoyed it just as much as I did. Okay. I hope you learn more about India, because India is going to play a very big role long-term, 5, 10, 15 years from now. And U.S. staying strong because China is trying to get India to be on sale like many other countries are to them. And India is saying, no, I think we can hang uh, uh, and uh, compete with you directly. And you kind of saw what he had to say. Curious to know what you took away from this. By the way, if you've never seen my uh, visit, we did vlog style when I was in India. Take a look at this because it also has a part of me meeting with Divyang Turaki, who was the youngest billionaire at the time. And I gave a speech to 5,000 students at IIT, which, you know, uh, he used to be a professor at for math. So if you've never seen that, click over here. And if you've never seen my interview with the former chairman of the State Bank of India, 400, I think 240,000 employees, Arundhati Bacharya, click over here to watch that interview as well. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye.